So we're pretty much done with integration by parts. Um, it did occur to me that maybe we should we should do at least one definite integral. And because the point of this problem is the definite integral, I'll make the part straightforward with an example we've seen before, x times the sine of x. And I mean, this is very typical of how all of these integration techniques are going to work which is that we're going to just ignore the limits of integration for a bit. We need an antiderivative. We need an indefinite integral. So we'll just find the indefinite integral. I mean, I shouldn't say just, but we'll find the indefinite integral. We won't do anything with zero or pi down here, and then once we found it, we'll write it up here and we'll plug the numbers in and we'll do the subtraction. So moving a little fast because we have spent two days on this topic already, negative x, the cosine of x minus the integral, that's u v, minus the integral of v du. I, I mean, you could take that integral, you could figure it out. I always think life's a little easier if you don't have stray negative signs and stray constants floating around inside the integral. So let's take that negative sign out. It will then cancel with that negative sign to give us addition. Negative x, the cosine of x, plus the sine of x. And just for neatness, because I'm using the indefinite integral symbol, I'll write the plus c. But when we go up here, there is no need for a constant of integration. And now I have run out of space, but let's see. What happens when we plug pi in? Well, the cosine of pi is going to be negative one. So we'll get negative pi times negative one. The sine of pi is zero. So we'll get positive pi. And what happens when we plug zero in? Let's see this, wait. Oh, we in fact get nothing. Um, the cosine of zero is one, but then it gets multiplied by zero, and the sine of zero is zero. So we end up with pi. We'll now move on to the next section, unless anybody has straight questions about integration by parts. So the next section is a few topics. Um, I never, or I usually don't cover all of them, but there are certainly a few that we should cover. And I mean, the general theme 
You're me tying all of the topics together. Is that we've got integrals where we've got the powers of signs. And cosines. So something like just writing down something more or less at random. You know, maybe we have the sign to the fifth of X. Or maybe we've got signs and cosines together. Maybe we've got powers of other trig functions. I don't always get to this just for time reasons, but maybe we have a tangent raised to a power. So the introductory remark I'm going to make, let's um, look at powers of psi to begin. The introductory remark I'm going to make is that there are some, there's no way I can write, I'm going to need to throw in parentheses, I think. There are some powers of trig functions that we can take already. We can already take the sine to the fifth of x times the cosine of x, at least in theory. And probably, if you don't see that, probably the way that would emphasize it would be if we wrote it like that. And now you've got a function inside of parentheses, and you've got the derivative of that function outside of the parentheses. So this looks like what? U substitution. Thank you very much. And it is precisely that. If we let U be the sign of X, I wish. I wish you wouldn't get used in two different integration methods, but it's just kind of tradition. So this is U substitution, not, uh, not parts. We let U be the sine of X, DU be the cosine of X DX. And this turns into U to the fifth DU. So that's one sixth u to the sixth plus c. One sixth times u is the sine, the sine of x to the sixth plus c. And the big trick of this section is going to be to say, well, but what if we didn't have that cosine? What if we just had the sine of x to the fifth? And that was all that we had. Well, we couldn't proceed in the way that we proceeded here because there's nothing to make du out of if do that u be the sum. This isn't a product. It's not um, solvable via parts. So none of the methods we know obviously work here. Um, and we're going to have to use a trick. And this trick 
is kind of delicate. All tricks in calculus to are kind of delicate. This particular trick is based around the fact that that power we are raising the sign to is an odd power. There are tricks we can use if we have it raised to an even power, but the even power instantly becomes 10 times worse. I don't know if I'm going to take the time to talk about it in this class. Um, so we've got the sine of x raised to an odd power. And the trick, what else, for else you can say about it, it's very mechanical. The sine to an odd power will always be dealt with in the same way. And that's to rewrite as the sine of x to an even power times the sine of x. That is to say, if we have the fifth power, that's the same as having the fourth power times the sine of x. And now we think, well, isn't it a shame that we just have sines here? I mean, in this frame, we had sines and cosines, and because of that, we were able to do a U substitution. I mean, what if instead of having sines here, we had cosines? Then we could let U be the cosine of X and du would be the sine of x dx. And now you see what the purpose was of pulling that one of those signs out. It was so that we'd have du in a u substitution. But unless we can rewrite this, so that instead of the sine, we have the cosine. This is just sort of idle, idle chat. Does anybody remember a formula that relates the sine and the cosine together? Could you just to add pi over two since that's how far apart they are? That's an interesting thought. You're thinking it's something like the sine of x equals the cosine of, I forget whether we should have addition or subtraction there, but you could do that. That's really a clever idea which is not quite going to work. And the reason it's not going to quite work is that if we now try to do U substitution, we'll have to let U be that, and then DU would be this, and we don't have the sign of that. We just have the sign of X. So what we're going to do instead is 
kind of more of a hassle than that suggestion, but we're going to say, well, this famous identity the Pythagorean identity relates the sine and the cosine so this is a true statement However, we can't solve for the psi, or rather, if we solve for the sign, something bad is going to happen. If we solve for the sign, well, two bad things are going to happen. First, we get a square root, and any integral involving a square root is going to be messy or likely to be messy. Then we have that plus or minus symbol, and we don't know how to integrate a plus or minus symbol. Or I should say, rather than saying I, we don't know how to do it, I should say we So let's go to the next frame and let's sort of collate what we have. We've heard this fifth power. Into the fourth power. We've pulled out a sign. And our hope is that we're going to be able to do a U substitution like this. That again is the foot is the reason that we do that. So for this hope to be fulfilled. We need to turn that sign to the fourth, to a sign, and the trick here, it's not obvious, we'll just put it down. The trick here is that any even power can be thought of as a square raised to something else. So for example, x8 is x squared to the fourth x twelfth is x squared to the six. x to the fourth is x squared squared. And the sine of x to the fourth is the sine of x squared squared. And I press the wrong button. Whatever it undid doesn't seem to be very important. And then going back to our discussion on the previous frame, if we have the sine of x squared, that can turn into cosines. The Pythagorean identity says that the sine of x squared is one minus the cosine squared of x.
And at this point, we can use U substitution. And it will be the very U substitution I keep saying we want to use. U is the cosine, du is the negative sine of x. We don't quite have that. We don't have this negative sign. But if we put two negative signs in, they cancel each other out. And now we do have the negative sign of x. Is it obvious to everyone why I'm able to put one of the negative signs inside the integral and the other one outside the integral? Then, nope, that negative sign we will not have anymore because this is going to turn into one minus u squared squared. And then that negative sign inside of the integral is going to turn into du. And now the, uh, the dark side of this technique, um, it always works in theory, as long as you have an odd power, but it always gives us some factored into, um, polynomial that we have to integrate. And the only way we know how to integrate a polynomial is to unpack it, is to foil it out and then we can just deal with it on a term-by-term -term basis. So there's nothing so bad here. We can foil this out. One minus two u squared plus u to the fourth. And then we can integrate u minus two-thirds u cubed plus one-fifth u to the fifth. I put this entire thing in parentheses because remember, we've got that negative sign in front of it. Negative u plus two-thirds u cubed minus one-fifth u to the fifth plus c. And u is the cosine, so I am not going to try to uh, squeeze this in at the bottom of this frame. I'm going to copy over u is the cosine of x. And we figured out that the integral is negative u plus two-thirds u cubed minus one-fifth u to the fifth. Plus c. So one thing, I mean, about this technique, I guess sort of a downside, but it can't really be helped, is that there's really no way to check our work. If we took the derivative of this, we'd think we did something wrong. We get an answer that looked absolutely nothing like um, the sine of x to the fifth. But 
you know from trigonometry. I mean, we probably don't remember them anymore. I certainly don't. But all of these identities, powers of sine, powers of cosine, double angle formulas, half angle formulas, we get an answer that was equivalent to the sine of x to the fifth, but written in a very different way. So, a few remarks about this technique. I said at the beginning, well, all of these techniques are kind of specialized. And I drew your attention to the fact that the sine of x was being raised to an odd power. If the sine of x were being raised to an even power, the stuff we just did wouldn't work. Why wouldn't it work? Well, think what that trick was. We converted to, from sines to cosines. And then we had When we did that conversion, we saved a sign so that we'd be able to use it in a U substitution. Here, if we try to save a sign, that even power now becomes odd. And what was the next step in this process? Well, it was to write the power as a square, but only even powers can be written as squares. The, um, the sine of x raised to the seventh power The next step is to try to rewrite that. I was right the first time. The next step is to try to rewrite that as the sine squared to a power. And we cannot proceed. Um, it's not, you know, not a square raised to a power. So, we need it to be odd initially. Odd initially. So that when we do this rewriting and when we pull out hitting buttons at random, I feel like. We need it to be odd initially so that it becomes even when we pull a sign out. We need it to be even because our plan is to write this as something squared raised to a power and only even numbers can be written in that way. Another limitation of this technique, maybe this is a gloomy way to do calculus. I've just introduced the technique and I'm already talking about its limitations, but this really does not work well, if you have large powers. It's really a specialized technique for like the third and the fifth power, maybe the seventh if you absolutely have to. And I mean, there's no strictly mathematical reason for that. We can still go through the full process if we have, say, sine to the 11th. It's the sine to the 10th. 
times the sine, we pour sine out and we save it. I always have just sort of reproduce this every time we need it. So the um, sine squared of x is one minus the cosine of x. The sine to the 10th is the sine squared of x to the fifth. We've still got this sine of x hanging out here. One minus the cosine squared of x raised to the fifth. Still got this sign hanging out here. And then we do our u substitution. So nothing has gone wrong per se. We need a negative sign, but we've dealt with that many times. We'll put them in. One minus u squared to the fifth du. Well, the only way we're going to integrate that is to foil it. And here's where having a large initial power sort of bites us, because the higher the initial power, the higher the power we're going to have to deal with now. And I mean, I say foiling, but it's not foiling exactly. To simplify this, we've got to take those five terms and multiply them all together and get, it would be what, the 10th degree polynomial. So it's just, I mean, mathematically everything's going fine in practice. I, there's only so much of this multiplication you can do before your human nature intrudes and you write down a three when you meant to write down a four and now your answer is hopelessly wrong and you'll never be able to figure out where you made a mistake. So if you're, do, if you're working by hand, you really need smaller powers. Of course, if you're not working by hand, if you're working by a computer, um, that won't be an issue. Then again, if you're working by a computer, you're probably just going to ask the computer to take the integral for you. I, I don't know what the point would be of sort of half using a computer to, to do the foiling, but not anything else. Even if you're using a computer, though, I, I mean, I do think, you know, in some ways the calculus two curriculum is tricky, but I do think there's value in this. I mean, you can use a computer to take an integral and get some wild polynomial of trig functions and have literally no idea what's happening or why there's this polynomial or where it comes from. I do think there is value in understanding what the computer is doing, even if you're not working by hand. Having sort of discussed some limitations of this method, let's talk about some good things about it. It's not all bad news. A lot of times when we've got powers of sines or powers of cosines, we're going to have both 
of those in the same integral. There are in like modeling and working with periodic functions. There are lots of situations where you'll have sines and cosines mixed together. And the great news is that if you have powers of sines and cosines mixed together, as long as one of them is odd, we'll keep with the sign. You see that sign is raised to an odd power. This technique will still work perfectly. There are no modifications that need to be made. And I mean, the reason this technique just keeps working perfectly is when we do the substitution, we'll let ju be the cosine. And this cosine squared will just turn into u squared. It won't do any harm. Let's see if that in action. where we've got this odd power, we're still going to pull one of these out and turn it into an even power. This cosine we are going to leave B. We won't deal with it until the very end of the problem. And our odd power is now an even power. The fact that our odd power is now an even power allows us to rewrite it as a square as um, a square raised to a power, in this case, as a square squared. This sign of x that we pulled out for u substitution is still just sitting there. That cosine squared of x is still just sitting there. The sine squared is one minus the cosine squared. That sine of x is still just sitting there. That cosine of x is still just sitting there. We do the precise same substitution. We're missing a negative sign. We solve that in the accustomed way. We get negative the integral of one minus u squared squared. This negative and this sign and this dx all turn into du. And then this cosine squared becomes a u squared. Nah, let's not try to cram it in. Let's copy over. 
one minus u squared squared times u squared du. Make sure that's right, and let's also jot down what u is. U is the cosine of x. Uh, once again, we're going to have to foil this out. Um, that u squared is really not hurting anything. It's not making our life any harder. Let's just foil out or expand that power. 1 minus 2u squared plus u to the 4th times u squared du. And now this u squared simply distributes. We're doing algebra. U squared minus 2u to the 4th plus u to the 6th du. Don't forget the negative sign. 1 third u cubed minus 2 fifths u to the 5th plus 1 seventh u to the 7th plus C. Yeah. Now that negative sign will distribute through. And let's go ahead and replace our U's with cosines in the same step. Negative one third, the cosine cubed of X plus two fifths, the cosine to the fifth of X minus one seventh, the cosine to the seventh of x, plus our constant of integration. The other piece of good news is that, um, is that dealing with powers of cosine, with odd powers of cosine, is done in basically the same way. Yeah. I could